begin by reading the whole chapter, Revelation 18. Follow along with your Bible. After these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean bird, unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth had committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her double according to her works. In, in the cup which she hath filled, fill to her double. How much she hath glorified herself, and lived deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her. For she saith in her heart, I sit a queen, and am no widow, and shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come, and the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise any more. The merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and of pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and all thyine wood and all manner vessels of ivory and all manner vessels of most precious wood and of brass and iron and marble and cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat and beasts and sheep and horses and chariots and slaves and souls of men. And the fruits that thy soul lusteth after are departed from thee, and all things which were dainty and goodly are departed from thee, and thou shalt find them no more at all. The merchants of these things which were made rich by her shall stand afar off for the fear of her torment, weeping and wailing and saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. For in one hour so great riches is come to naught. And every shipmaster and all the company in ships and sailors and as many as trade by sea stood afar off and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? And they cast dust on their heads, and cried weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city, wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness. For in one hour is she made desolate. Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone, and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down, and shall be found no more at all. And the voice of harpers and musicians and of pipers and trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee, and no craftsman of whatsoever craft he be shall be found any more in thee, and the sound of a millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee, and the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee, and the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee, for thy merchants were the great men of the earth, for by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain 
upon the earth. If we go back to verse 1 of chapter 18, we find a heavenly angel coming down. The Bible records, After these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. Many times something of the heavenly realm comes and, and, and dwells among us, dwells in this earth, you automatically see a darkness that has lightened upon it, lightning upon it. His great glory is seen because of the light that he brings. Now we see now the earth being a very dark place, a very dim place, a very, a very um, a just earthly and carnal place. It's when the spiritual realm enters in, his glory is shown very clearly. Light obviously and very clearly shines in a dark place. A dark room, only a candle can be lit and it will give great light there. Here a heavenly angel comes and when he comes he's bringing a message to the people of earth. Verse 2 says, And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and it is become the habitation, and it continues on. So Babylon is fallen, is fallen, is the cry that's made. We saw that also in Revelation 14 and verse 8. And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of, wrath, of the wrath of her fornication. That same cry coming from a mighty angel, I believe this is perhaps a time stamp here. And when we looked at Revelation 14 as a whole, we saw it as, as a picture of almost like a 5,000 foot view of everything that's going to be going on in the last days. And so that would make sense then that that same cry, that same time stamp is, is pointing to the event that's happening here. Now, this is on the heels of Revelation 17, which gave us a lot of insight of, as to the particulars of each character that is coming into play in this last day's saga, if you will. It says here that Babylon is fallen, but at this point she's not yet destroyed. We saw that same thing come to pass over in Revelation chapter 14. This mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abomination of the earth, essentially has her days numbered. She's, she's fallen. She's, she's done for from this time on, only the destruction awaits. What does it record of her the second half of chapter 18 and verse 2? And it says, She has fallen and is become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. So it's an habitation, and hold, a cage for these devils, these spirits, these birds, and I would hazard to say even of men. Babylon is a great trap. She has, she has captured men with everything that she has to offer them. And we see that as it plays out because the whole world, the merchants of it, are flocking unto her and trapped up and tripped up in the fornication that she offers. And when we see this phrase of devils and of foul spirits and of unclean and hateful birds, I think that's bringing it all to a, a, a spiritual picture where we can understand, spiritually speaking, that this is just a place where a ton of devils live and foul spirits as well as well as unclean and hateful birds. It's just this, this place that is reserved for these flying, winged, dark creatures to just abide and prosper and live and, and do what these unclean and hateful things do. They're very comfortable here in Babylon. And then you marvel, well, why would men then be so comfortable? A lot of people, when they think of birds, they think of those beaks and those talons and and these sharp, offensive things that, that are used to attack people with. And then when you attach to that foul spirits and devils, it makes you wonder why anybody would want to be in a place like this. And yet they are. Why? Because there's something about her that draws men in. Let's continue reading in verse 3. It says, For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So they are trapped up and tripped up and, and caught and allured and drawn in because of her fornication, because of her lasciviousness and the lusts of the flesh have, have drawn all nations to her to, to the end too, that they are drunken by the allurement and attraction that she brings. 
whenever you're drunk, you're not thinking correctly. Your mind is blurred. You can't see straight. You don't understand things that are far off. You're living in the moment, and in that moment, you can't even function correctly as a human being. And the effect of Babylon is the same on men. Why else would men want to dwell where devils and unclean beasts live and, and, and hateful birds? Why would men want to be in a spiritual dark and dismal and wicked place if they weren't drunk and attracted there by the lusts of their own flesh? That shows you the darkness that is in men, how, how, how it, it gets easily attracted to darkness itself. We're always being trapped and drawn into fornication, let's say, for example into drunkenness, into unclean thinking, into, into um, basically just, just filth. Our flesh is dirty, our flesh is rotten, and our flesh is always going to want the things that are dark and lustful and sensual, but we have to put that aside in order to walk in the Spirit and, and, and crucify the flesh day in, day out, moment by moment, lest we get trapped and tripped up in Mystery Babylon and her ways in specific. So it says here that the kings committed fornication, and they're to be judged of the same. It says, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and then it continues on, and we find here in Revelation 18, the first mention of a new group, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. These merchants then, these, these, these wayfaring men, these, these sellers, these, these uh, tradesmen, these merchants have waxed rich through Babylon's abundance, and that's the major draw on their flesh. We have the kings who desire the carnal, fleshly, sensual fornication. Now we have the merchants that desire the wealth the abundance, the delicacies, and that, that twofold cord is, is not quickly broken in this world. Those two come together and meet in a place where basically the vast majority of people are sucked into and trapped by Babylon and her towns. Now remember, we learned much about Babylon in the previous chapter. It was about a month ago, but you can go back and listen to it again, or just read the previous chapter. We didn't exactly identify her particular, and I'm not necessarily promising that we are going to identify her in particular today, but what we will see is we will see how, like, by type, what she represents, who she is, and how she could actually live today, but she has been essentially around since the beginning. Mystery Babylon the Great is an offshoot, is the offspring, is, is the mother of harlots, of of abomination of the world. This has been a system, this has been a city, this has been a world power since the beginning of time. This mystery Babylon, the great, and all of the lust that she does have lived along with her. I think though that these merchants, they give us a clue as to who this woman is. So in chapter 17 and verse 4, it says, Of the woman, the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hands full of abomination and filthiness of her fornication. It says she is, has a name, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. She is decked then with gold, silver, precious jewels. She is very rich and, and shows it outwardly, just the vastness of her wealth. She's arrayed with, she's decked with and what she does is she provides to these merchants of the earth the same abundance. She is so rich and yet she has a little bit to share, to spread about the merchants of the earth. And this is why they flock to her. This is why they come to her because they desire to be rich as she is. Go back to Revelation 18 and look at verse 4 and it says this, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. And so whenever you're caught up, or you're, you're captivated by, or you're looking to a system that revolves itself around abundance of wealth, around delicacies, around carnal and fleshly desires, you got to think to yourself these very words of God, come out from among her. When something is sensual, it is not spiritual. When something is about abundance and about rich and wealth, 
it is not talking about the riches of heaven, but rather the riches of this life, which we are to turn from. We're to forsake riches in this life if they are keeping us from true riches that we can lay up in store in heaven. And so here the angel cries out, and this is almost a timeless cry, Come out from among her, my people. Way back in the beginning, come out from among her and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. We need to come out from the ways of the world, because the ways of the world are led about by this mystery harlot. Revela uh, revealed in Revelation chapter 17, and now here again in chapter 18. Now, why do we need to come out? What, because we need not to be partakers of her sins. In other words, there's an hour of temptation that comes where Mystery Babylon sins are to the full and everyone is sucked into and trapped thereby. Okay, And everybody is given an opportunity, essentially, a temptation dangled before them to take part in these sins. And it's going to be no different in these last days. The more people are forsaking and removing themselves from the ways of God, from the, the meeting house, from the assembly of the believers, you're going to find that these people more and more are trapped by, are allured by, are sucked in by the lusts of this life, by the things of this world. And so, there is an hour, a moment of temptation, I believe, for everybody where God essentially brings you to it. And at that point, you need to decide if you're going to follow Him or you're going to follow the ways of this life. Even Christ Himself was brought to that hour of temptation before the devil. And you know what He did? He used the Word of God to keep Himself in focus. By time, we can look to that and see, look, Christ, when brought to temptations to have what? Great power to satisfy His own carnal desires, to eat of the bread. When Christ was given opportunity to, to, to glory in men and in their worship, Christ said, thus saith the Lord, thus saith the Lord, thus saith the Lord. And that's our example. That's our type. When we're brought to that hour of temptation, we need to say, thus saith the Lord, thus saith the Lord, thus saith the Lord. And we can be bringing that same verse to remembrance. Come out from among them, be separate. That's God's always and, and constant call to us. Come out, be separate. Come out, be separate. Don't go in the way of that temptation. Forsake that hour of temptation. Why? That you receive not of her plagues. Because if you give yourself over to the lusts of the flesh, the lusts of the eyes, and the pride of life, you will suffer the same types of plagues that the world does. You will be overtaken with the same plagues that the world is. And so we need to be focused. We need to be steadfast. We need to be sure of what the Bible says so that we can be sure of what direction we ought to be walking in. It's always in the scriptural direction. It's always in the biblical direction that the Christian ought to yield themselves. When we're making a decision, we don't react based on our flesh because our flesh, by and large, is going to take us the way of the merchants of this world. We're going to go after abundance. We're going to go after delicacies. If not, then we're going to be taking the way of the kings of this world. Or are we going to go after the power, the riches, the fornication? Mixing mixing relational things that belong unto God, spiritual things, and, and giving them over to a devil. It's fornication in this life. It's, it's spiritual fornication. So continue on in verse 5, Revelation chapter 18. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. So God has remembered it's in his mind, not as if he needed to forget it, but he's brought it to remembrance, her iniquities, and therefore because he has remembered essentially throughout time all of the wickedness that she has been partaker of, he has rendered her to be worthy of double honor, let's say. A double portion of the judgment that is to come. Watch, and you can read that down. It says, God hath remembered her iniquities, verse 6, reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her double according to her works. In the cup which she hath filled, fill to her double. The cup's already full. How do you fill to a double? There's some sort of spiritual judgment going on at this place. The temporal cup is full. Judgment is falling on Babylon. And yet God has more to fill up the judgment of this great whore at this time. There is more and she is worthy of a double portion of judgment. A double portion of redemption. And this is how God steps in. 
even as she rewarded you, redemption day is here. God will recompense us, we need to understand that. And not only just an eye for an eye, is God prepared for those that hate Him and those that are fighting against His people? Not just eye for an eye, no, 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 no. God has a double portion, a worthy portion. She spilled up her judgment, but I got more, is what God here is saying. He said, fill to her double according to her works. If she put out one eye, she's getting two put out. That's what the Bible, I believe, is recording here. A double portion of the judgment that is due and the swift recompense of God is coming someday down the line. Now, notice her pomp and notice her pride as she stands before the living God. And as I was reading these the first time ever, this was one of the things in Revelation 18 that really stood out to me was the fact that there was a woman, there was a world of kings, there were merchants that were standing against the living God, and the more you read, the more you see that they are without excuse. They know it's the Lord, and yet they are constantly pushing against it. It started to, it started to get my mind turning, and started to stir up my soul to be like, these people are standing against God. These people are willingly and knowingly standing against the Lord. And look at the pomp and pride that she displays. It says in verse 7, For how much she hath glorified herself. God deserves all the glory. Yet look at this woman and how much she has glorified herself. And lived deliciously. So much torment and sorrow give her. So as much as she has lifted herself up, with pride, As much as she has lived deliciously and had of the greatest things in this world, so much give her the judgment due unto her. For she saith, it continues, in her heart, I sit a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow. So what's she saying here? I sit a queen and no widow? Well, it actually comes to my mind here. How can you be a widow if there was never a husband? She's in Harlan. She has no interest in getting tied down to any one particular man, kingdom, whatever. Remember her ways are movable that thou canst not know them? She's at Harlan. So of course she's no widow. Even if she would have killed every man that she had been with, she's never a widow because she was never married to them. Even if they would have died of natural... It doesn't matter because she was never married to them. She said, I sit a queen. You know what? She's Miss Independent, isn't she? She's like, she's like the crying call of the young ladies of society today. I'm a queen. No, I don't need no man. And the, and the, and the, the movement is this. Like, I, you know, I don't need a man. You know, I, I, I can do it without a man. And then eventually they're just like, I am a man. Right? It just, it's just this natural tendency of, of women... And this movement of feminism to just remove any kind of lady-likeness into her. It's amazing that she even calls herself a queen at this point. But she says, I am no widow and shall see no sorrow. You know what she's saying? I can't be destroyed. I will never be sad. I'm going to live my life the way I want to. This harlot woman, this societal entity, this city, she's like, I'm no widow. Well, there was never a husband, of course. And this pride every single time, if you exhibit it, even as a believer, it will knock you on your tail. The Bible says pride goeth before destruction, and an haughty spirit before a fall. We need to guard ourselves against pride, especially this type of pride, which just says, I'll never see sorrow. I'm always going to be on the up and up. I'm always going to be successful. Look at me. Basking in your own glory, living deliciously and setting yourself as, as if that will never change. That, that's, that's pompous. That's pride. And that's exactly what she's exhibiting here. And no wonder she fell. And no wonder the fall of her was such that it was a double portion of what was worthy. And this is what God is saying here. Continue on in verse 8. It says, There shall her plagues come in one day. Death and mourning and famine she shall be utterly burned with fire for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her in one day all of this great glory all of this great pomp all of this I shall never see any sorrow was brought to nothing by way of her her great death 
by way of the mourning, by way of the famine, all at the hands of the Lord who judgeth her. And the Bible says he is strong to do so. One day, all this world will realize of the living God, even though they're willingly pushing away from Him, and they're willingly saying, I want nothing to do with them. They're willingly saying, I sit a queen and shall not see sorrow, puffing themselves up against God. One day, they will all see Him as the one who is strong to judge it. He has strength to judge. He here utterly burns with fire, Mystery Babylon the Great destroys her. How much pomp she had was brought to ruin in one day. And you got to think to yourself, even in times past or even today, great cities, great kingdoms, great, great empires that we have here on this earth. Could you imagine them being brought to nothing in a day? And then confessing anything else but, Strong is the Lord that judgeth her. Because these cities are fortified. These cities are strong. These cities have infrastructure to fight against any kind of attack of this world. But yet strong is the Lord which judgeth her. The world is going to see that he's not just this big guy in the sky. You know, you, you, you tickle his beard and he'll just give you your wishes. They're going to see that he's not just this, this, this genie in a lamp. Right? Where somebody who chooses to could just could just rub the lamp and then get their three wishes and he just does whatever. They're not gonna they're gonna see that he's not this long haired, effeminate, kind of girly man that just goes about love, 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 love and, 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 and has never had a crossword with anybody. He loves everybody no matter what. They're gonna see strong is the Lord God which judgeth her. God will finally get the glory that has deserved His name, and people will finally see that there's two sides to God. He is fully love and fully compassion and fully rewards His servants. He is also harsh, just, and judge, and a judge of those that choose to not follow after His ways. There's both sides to God. He is fully love. He is also fully judgment righteous indignation and anger toward the wicked every day the Bible says he has reserved for them and here God makes specific example even a spectacle of mystery Babylon this great the greatest of empires now this is from her perspective remember if you were to look back into Daniel you would find that that actually we are depreciated Men aren't getting greater, stronger, smarter, faster. No. Even our empires aren't getting greater, stronger, you know. None of that is true. The first Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, was that head of gold, right? Afterward, Median Persia, which was of silver, the shoulders and the arms. After that, we had brass. After that, we had iron mixed with... And we're in the iron mixed with miry clay. Partly strong, partly broken time period. And yet that same pride just rings through. She's the weakest of all the great kingdoms that have lived, right? This manifestation of her is nothing compared to what Babylon was back in the time of Nebuchadnezzar. She's got nothing to boast of, and yet she's so full of pride, she's just, she's just oozing with it, just, just rejoicing in herself and how great she is as a city, as a kingdom, as a world leader, right? She's rejoicing in all these things, but she's not what you would appear. It's not what you would expect when you when you see how much she boasts in herself and the reality. You ever, you ever seen that sometimes with really proud people, the ones that talk the most, they really don't have a lot to back it up. And this is Mystery Babylon and, and the core of her. She's she's all about her glory. She's all about her her deliciousness of her lifestyle. She's like, I'm a queen, I will never see sorrow, everything's always going to be great but she's partly strong and partly broken at this time. And it will be revealed and God will make a spectacle out of her to prove to her and to everyone else that is following in her ways that she is nothing. Nations are nothing in the sight of God Almighty who is strong to judge of her. Verse 9, it says, And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for fear of her torment, saying, Alas! 
Yes, unless that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. Now, they're bewailing her, and it's not because they loved her. You notice that? And this is, the, uh, this is the example that we have, too. When somebody puts themselves, when a young lady puts herself out as a whore and has many lovers, the lovers don't love her, though they're called that, right? They loved her, and they're bewailing her now because they lived deliciously by her, because of what she had to offer them. They loved her and they're bewailing her now because she satisfied the lusts of their fornication. That's why these kings are like, oh no, this great city. Her greatness they enjoyed and they partook of that, but they didn't really love Babylon. And the only reason they're, they're mourning her loss now is because they're thinking of themselves and what they are now losing. It's just, just, a, just a little idea about purity. When you give somebody of yourselves, right, too soon, right, N not in the proper binds of a marriage, right, in a, in a whoredom situation, you are setting yourself up to lose greatly. And the person that has given their heart to you doesn't love you at all. They love what they can get from you. Young men, young women need to be conscious of this, and when they are searching for a spouse, they need to be searching for a spouse. Somebody who they get along with, somebody that they love, somebody that, it's, a, it's an aside from all of the physical attraction, all of the um, financial attraction, all of what the person has to offer you, you ought to be attracted to the person, okay? And Mystery Babylon is a great example of what happens to so many young ladies these days when they think that when they're like 14, 15, 16, they've found love. It's always just some jerk, some dude that's just trying to get a piece, okay? And I've seen it time and time again. They fall in love, and then he dumps her. They fall in love, and then he dumps her. And she is ruined in the end, and then when she falls, because of the depression and because of the the judgment of, of what has happened and maybe maybe there's a child that's that's cons consumed because of it maybe, maybe that maybe drugs or alcohol get involved and then she is ruined and there's nothing left of her because she's given herself to all of these men right when there's nothing left they won't be there they may mourn and lament what they've lost because of what they had physically received from her but ultimately this is an example of how the world loves and how the world engages in relationships. And this is the opposite of what Christians should look for. When you're looking for a spouse, don't, don't take regard to the abundance of their delicacies, to the lust in, that you have because of that person. No, it ought to be something that is, is real. And it ought to be an attraction to a person, not just what that person has. It's a privilege that comes by being with them. Okay, we're going to continue on. These kings are bewailing. They're standing afar off. And there's another indication. When she is falling at this time, right, they're not there helping, are they? They're standing afar off, saying, whoa, whoa, look at that great judgment. Okay? Continues on in verse 11. It says, and the merchants here now, and the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her. Why? For no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. Again, they have no attraction, no lasting bond to the woman, Mystery Babylon, they're just like, no one's going to buy the stuff anymore. No one's going to buy the merchandise anymore. Here, this world had brought all of their things, okay? The merchants from this side of the earth and from that side of the earth were all bringing this great amount of merchandise to sell it within Babylon. She became a market of types. It continues on and it shows the types of things that she had. Merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and fine wood and all manner of vessels of ivory and all manner of vessels most precious wood. It continues on in verse 13 and cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil it continues on to the very end and it says and slaves and souls of men. Her, her great merchandise and the things that she was merchandising in were things that you mined, were things that you harvested and they were also in people and the souls of men. 28 things that 
Mystery Babylon held in her marketplace as things that people would buy and sell and trade in. And the world brought all of these things to her, the great merchandise. You continue on in verse 14, and it says, And the fruits of which thy fruits that thy soul lusted after are departed from thee. And all things which were dainty and goodly are departed from thee, and thou shalt find no more at all. The fruits, that's the food of the rich people. If you think about it, we go to the market and we get all sorts of fruits from all over. But just think about what fruits actually just grow right here. And you'll find it's actually a very narrow list. We don't, we don't get bananas here and yet we eat them pretty plentifully and regularly here, do we not? It's because there's merchandise coming from abroad and settling on it. But that is how kings eat. We need to take a good hard look at ourselves and understand that we here in North America eat like kings used to hundreds of years ago. It was not common for fruits and vegetables from all over the world to be shipped and descended upon one place. We are very rich in this life, and we need to understand that. And yet here in Babylon, for the first time ever, it seems, that the food of the rich is found no more at all in her. Those things that are goodly, you know, the, the things of the rich people are no more found at all. She's losing all of the things that made her her. All of the riches, all of the delicacies, all of the, the greatness is gone and departing from her. Now, when we think of our world, the one that we live in currently in this situation right now, who purchases and consumes more of the world's goods than our neighbors to the south? We can't think of any nation. China's making lots of things and shipping it out, and lots of products come out of Japan. We can think of... Um, from the smallest African economy over there, who's probably dealing in coffee beans or other types of beans, they're coming to the shelves of America. From them to the biggest economies, China, sending all of their, all of their products, their mass-produced dainties and goodly things, are just flowing out of their factories and onto the shelves of America. So it's hard to imagine where we stand today that when this judgment upon Mystery Babylon falls, it would be anyone but our neighbors to the South America. Okay? Maybe a hundred years ago, we would think a little bit differently. We might think it was Great Britain or something going on over there because America wasn't established the world power that they were. Maybe 300 years before that, we'd have a different mindset. Maybe it would be based 400, 500 years somewhere in Rome. That we would think would be hard. Bottom line is Mystery Babylon, she moves, right? She's trying to fulfill this plan here, which is her own destruction, unfortunately. But she's doing it just by going from place to place to place. She doesn't abide in the house long, and she's moving from place to place to place. And where we stand today, no one consumes more than the USA. And even here in Canada, we sell much to our neighbors to the south, to a, to a fault. I mean, we got our own trees, we got our own water, we got our own our own stability as far as farmland goes, and yet we take all of it and sell it to America, you know what they do? They'll turn it around and just sell it right back to us, right? Their merchandising of us uh, is, is clear, and their merchandising of the whole world is clear. And so, the great things that you see coming across into the shelves of America are what I believe the Bible is referring to and were the events to unfold today. I don't see any other nation that would fit the bill for being such a consumer of the vastness of products of the entire world. I mean, everything just descends here. You look at some of the main harbors, and these ships are stacked miles high with just items and products and foods and, and, and just, just keeps flowing in. And yet that's going to come to an end. It says in verse 15, the merchants of these things which were made rich by her, shall stand afar off for fear of her torment, weeping and wailing. So they're standing back, again, not helping, not getting involved, not trying to, to soothe her. No, they're standing afar off, weeping and wailing. Verse 16, it says, saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, for in one hour so great riches is come to naught. And every shipmaster and all the company in the ships and sailors and as many as trade by the sea stood afar off and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this 
great city. We have the harvesters, we have the manufacturers, we have the shipmasters and their freight system. The total infrastructure, all the economy of the world is tied up into this woman. Mystery Babylon the Great and her city and what she represents. Today, we have the same thing where all of the economies of the world, are they not tied into one dollar? The almighty dollar, the American dollar, we base everything in the world and how it fluctuates upon how well America is doing. Why? Because everything infrastructure-wise and everything financial-wise and everything economy-based all hinders around her because she's the one buying all this stuff. She's the one bringing in all of the great and precious items, all of the delicacies. People are waxing rich by the consumerism that goes on in there. The magnitude of the collapse here is very real, and you can see that it's felt and realized globally. All those that trade by the sea are standing afar off, weeping and wailing and mourning that great city as she falls, Mystery Babylon. None are escaping it. It's not like there's going to be some nation off in the distance that has just not been, having, has not had their economy fully supported by the purchasing power of this great mystery woman. All of them are seeing, none are escaping, and all of them are feeling this catastrophe, this collapse of the global economy. It's all something that is something that they will experience and see and mourn as they stand afar off. Verse 19 says, And they cast dust on their heads, and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness, for in one hour is she made desolate. These are mourning in dust and ashes. They're like bringing back the Old Testament now. And they're literally throwing up dust and ashes and wailing and crying in the dirt. Bewailing the fact that what are we going to do? If she's destroyed, we're destroyed. And you can see how her fornication allowed her to get her tentacles into the entirety of the world. So that when she goes down... They go down with her. She had the king, she had the merchants, she had all nations coming to her to enjoy of her wealth and delicacies and all the things that she has to offer. And so now, when she's destroyed, they're destroyed with her. There's a great dramatics in her desolation. There's mourning. It's, it, it's emphasized. They, you can see it very clearly by the dust flying in the air that this is serious. This is for real. This judgment is final. This magnitude is sure, and everybody is going to experience this. Except for, look at verse 20, I love this. Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. We see that at such a time when the world is mourning because they don't have the things, they don't have the money, they don't have the delicacies, they don't have the riches and the abundance, there are holy men of God praising Him for the judgment that has fallen. He has avenged the, ju the just people, the right people on her. She has been destroyed because of the blood that was in her cup. You remember we talked about that before. There is great joy in heaven rejoicing over the fall of Mystery Babylon. And we can think about that and just meditate upon those things. And then when things get rough, just remember, everything is all right in the Father's house. When God is judging nations for their wickedness, when God is outpouring His wrath upon heathen people that have forgotten Him and rejected Him, we can rejoice and sing and be glad that God has finally brought to pass His righteous judgment upon nations that have forgotten Him, rejected Him, and destroyed His people as a result of their wicked hearts. We're avenged now, finally, and wonderfully so. There's rejoicing in heaven at this time, and a great celebration breaks out for the fact that mystery Babylon was violently judged. Look at verse 21, And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone, and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down, and shall be found no more at all. And you think to yourself, what, you know, you, when you're throwing stones into the water, what that, what that looks like. I found myself meditating upon that. When, when a great big stone hits the water, what does it do? Well, there's that big thunk noise, right? 
Also, the water is immediately dispersed, but then it does this cool thing where it all sucks back into place. The stone disappears. The judgment is final and after there's just that calmness. Thus shall mystery Babylon be thrown down. You know what's going to happen? Boom! Calm. And just in a moment, just in a day, just in a, just in a minute, God comes in and judges in that day, and the ripples for sure go out, and they impact all of the nations abroad. But in the epicenter, it's almost instantly calm again. And that's where God's people are going to be standing. Judgment, kablamo, and now we're here, and now we're in the calm, and we're rejoicing. You know why? Because we're not affected by the ripple effect of the destruction of Babylon. Why? Because way back there in verse 4, come out from them and be separate. If you want to entangle yourself in the affairs of this life, then get ready for the ripple effect of its fall. When this world is destroyed by God, and you got a little bit of this, of your your attraction and your lust tied up in something of this life, get ready for that to ripple. If we're all excited about our houses and our cars and our lands and our things and our possessions, when the world falls, when God's judgment comes, get ready for the ripple. But if we come out from among him, we stand with the angel as the judgment falls as a millstone, we can rejoice, we can celebrate, we can be exceeding glad for the judgment that fell. Why? Because everything that we love, everything that we desire, everything that we seek after is in heaven, completely still, completely calm. The only eruption and rumbling and shaking you will experience in heaven is the sound of many voices singing praise unto God. That'll be a great day. That'll be a wonderful day. And yet here in this life, they've got nothing to rejoice over. We will re be rejoicing over what is the complete lack of rejoicing that is going on here. Look at verse 22. And the voice of harpers and musicians and pipers and trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee. And no craftsman of whatever craft he be shall be any more in thee. And the sound of a millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee. And the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee. And the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth. For by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. And that's what she did. She, she seduced them. She drew them unto herself and offered, you know, riches and wealth and glory. And when you look at the list of things that are there that people used to rejoice over and used to celebrate in, what do we have here? Harpers, musicians, pipers, music. You know, are people obsessed with music in this life? Don't they love putting on their radio, buying their records, downloading the latest album, and just letting that stuff beat into their head? Hey, the Bible says that there shall be no more of that heard at all in Babylon when their fall comes. What about craftsmen, working crafts, you know, artistic people, people that love to, to expand their minds by getting involved in something beautiful and creating things with their own hands, just endeavoring to consume themselves with that, no more at all in thee. What about the people that are grinding a millstone, the laborers, how much do people invest themselves into the work of their hands, and they just love their job, and how often do you hear of people that when they retire from their job of 60 years or whatever it is, at 60, they retire, they end up committing suicide or something because they lose their purpose that they had. They fully immerse themselves in their, who they are becomes that job. And when the job is no more, whether they get laid off or they retire, they find no need to live after that. I've heard of cyclists too. Their whole life was cycling and then they have an injury. Next thing you know, they hang themselves because that was their identity. All these things that people identify themselves with, they're all connected to the whore. We gotta disconnect from the world. We gotta come out from among her and be separated unto God. And when we're separated unto God, then we can rejoice in the things of God. We can celebrate and rejoice when God judges these things that were nothing more than vain attractions to draw us away from Him. And we all have it. We all carry around a little vain attraction device in our pockets. We all go to jobs that sometimes we put a little bit too much of ourselves into. And that becomes a vain attraction. We all have relationships in this world that aren't even of the godly sort. And that becomes an attraction to us. 
Bible says that a light of a candle won't even be found at all because there's going to be nothing left of mystery Babylon when she is judged. And so we need to start to think about that now. Mystery Babylon is the system, is the world, is America as a whole, right? And what she represents. What are we holding on to in this life that we could afford to come out from among? We could relinquish. We could, we could give back so that we could give more time to God, more devotion to God, more love to God, more service to God. Because the time is coming where, without a choice, Mystery Babylon in one day will be consumed. And I don't want people in here, I don't want to be subject to the ripple effect of what happened when she is destroyed. When that millstone falls, when that explosion comes out, the ripple effect moves, I want to be part of the calm when it all settles at the epicenter. And I want to be I want to be part of God's chorus singing and praising for the vengeance that fell. I don't want to be subject to some of the vengeance as it falls. Verse 24 says, And in her was found the blood of the prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. And thus is the reason why she was judged. That is the reason why she was judged, because she made merchandise of God's people in the end. Bottom line, she destroyed men souls of men, took slaves of men, and made merchandise of them, drawing them away from the truth of God in order that they would be slain upon the earth. Blood of prophets, blood of slaves, blood of all that was slain is at the hands of this violent and vicious woman and what she represents as a whole. The seed of Satan, way back there in Genesis chapter 3. We've got the seed of the woman, we've got the that the seed of the servant. Okay? It's a, it's a tale as old as time. Right? And here she is finally manifested in, in her fullness. And her destructive end is clear and evident. How many stand off and mourn her falling because of what they had by her hand? Right? We need to remove ourselves from it. Start to draw nigh unto God. He'll draw nigh unto us. It's time to be separate. If there is ever a time to be separated under the things of God, now is it because, because I believe that events like this are coming to pass even before us. We're starting to see the great judgment of the great whore, Mystery Babylon the Great. When she falls, she will fall wonderfully so. Right? Be caught in the ripple. Thank God for the